Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصنا حي على الصنا حي على الفنا حي على الفنا الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلواتullahi wa salamuhu alayhi We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise Him because He is worthy of praise And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the evils within ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His peace and blessings upon the last and final messenger His companions, His family, His wives and all those who follow His way until the end of time يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما we remind one another to be people of taqwa and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the muttaqeen. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Amma ba'd. As we enter into the season of hajj, a season of blessings and barakat, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to maximize the reward that we can gain in these blessed days. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the journey of all those who will be doing hajj a safe one and a fulfilling one and a blessed one. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. Surah Al-Baqarah talks about the story of Hajj and that Hajj is a symbol of Tawheed. Every ritual of Hajj revolves around an aspect of La ilaha illallah. As it was manifested by the Muwahid, the Hanif, the Khalil of Ar-Rahman, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. And no doubt the Kaaba is at the center of the story of Hajj. And so Hajj and the Kaaba is symbolic and symbolizes La ilaha illallah. And Hajj is a yearly convention where Muslims from across the globe come together to unanimously, in a unified voice, proclaim to the world, we are the people of La ilaha illallah. We are the monotheists. And we are 
the authentic followers of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, this man who is revered by over half of the globe's population. But in these verses in Surah Al-Baqarah that talk about the Kaaba, that talk about Hajj, there is another message that the Kaaba is symbolic of. And that message is quite important and it's very necessary that we integrate it in our methods of engaging broader society. We know that in the earlier part of Medina, the first 16 months in which the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, he was praying towards Jerusalem. He was praying towards Jerusalem. But after those 16 months, and the Prophet ﷺ really wanted this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes with the verses commanding him and the believers to change the Qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca. And when this happened, Ya Habibi, it went trending, it went viral. It became the talk of the hour. The Christians, the Jews, and the polytheistic Arabs, they went crazy. Absolutely they just exploded. Why? You know, if Muslims today were to just make a decision, we're not going to pray to Mecca, we're going to pray somewhere else. Uh, is this really going to make any news? Who cares? Who cares? What's, what's, you know, who's going to go see Thor, the new Thor movie? That's the, more important to the minds of the Western world than where the Muslims face in terms of their Qibla. So why? that the Christians and the Jews and the polytheistic Arabs, why did they go crazy when the Qibla was changed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَلَّاهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا Allah says, the foolish people are criticizing you. They're asking, why, why did he change the Qibla? And it's so important to learn this lesson. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he did this, it was a message a very powerful message to the Christians and the Jews, as well as to polytheistic Arabs, that this ummah is an independent ummah. We do things our own way. You see, when the Muslims were facing Jerusalem, the Christians and the Jews were saying, these Muslims, they're just trying to imitate us. They're, mo they're just mim mimicking us, that's it. This Islam stuff, it's not real. They're trying to be like the sophisticated people because the Arabs used to look at Jews as higher class, more sophisticated, the learned people, the people with a stronger civilization. So when the Muslims were facing Jerusalem, they just said, nah, they, these guys, they're just imitating us. Sooner or later, they're, they're going to become Christian or Jews. And so when the Qibla changed, it sent them a different message. That's not what's going on. We're independent from you. We have our own ways. We have the Quran, we have our own prophets. And so they felt like these, this ummah, this ummah of Islam, okay, now this is becoming a greater problem. These guys are coming with their own way. And they have, we have lost our grasp or our grip over them. And for the polytheistic Arabs, when the Muslims were facing Jerusalem, that drove them crazy. You have betrayed your forefather Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. You have left the ways of the Arabs. And then when the, we face back to the Qibla, it sent them the message that we face the Qibla not because it's traditional or customary to our society, but rather because we are authentically following Ibrahim alayhi salam and his tawheed while you are you all, you, you Qurashis, you have fabricated and adulterated the way of our fathers. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after saying, they ask, why you change the Qibla? قُلْ لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ We face the Qibla in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Hajj is a symbol of Tawheed, a symbol of our submission to Allah. The Kaaba and the Qibla is a symbol of our submission to Allah. We are not boxed into the customs of a people. The ideologies, the man-made ideologies, we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in the verse after, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا 
like that, meaning we change the qibla to make you the moderate, just, best religion so that you Muslims are witnesses over society. In other words, you become the leaders, the role models for re the rest of society. Our way, the Islamic way, the Islamic ideology, the Quran and Sunnah are always moderate, in the middle, and the most just. And you best, we best appreciate this when we compare it to other ideologies. And in this regard, Roe versus Wade, you have two sides here, and I'll get to that in a moment. But we Muslims, how are we behaving? You find Muslims who are pro-choice and Muslims who are pro-life. Is Islam pro-choice in accordance to the liberal conception of this term? Or are Muslims pro-life in accordance to the conservative Republican understanding of this term? And the answer is not this and not that. We as Muslims need to get our minds out of the either or of Western society. Now look, let's be very just and very honest here. The West has done things that are absolutely phenomenal. Advancements in medicine, advancements in technology and sciences, the administrative organization of the Western world, among many other things that we really should look to and learn from. There's a lot to benefit. But when it comes to other realms, the Western world is not healthy for humanity. And we need to acknowledge this and get out of this either or. This, we're conservative or liberal, or we're Republican or Democrat. We're not either. And so don't box Islam into this. Hajj is a reminder of who we really are. The moderate religion, the moderate way of life, the balanced way of life that is meant to lead and be a role model for the rest of people. And so when we aspire to this meaning and remind ourselves when we face Mecca and when our brothers and sisters are doing their hajj, what we are meant to be, what our legacy is meant to be, then we can do much more for this society, for all of humanity, to bring better, to bring good, to reconcile, to fix that which needs fixing, to improve that which can be improved. When we do this, we are not only living by what Islam means, but we are helping the rest of the world be, become better. And so to do this, we as Muslims, we must acknowledge certain realities when it comes to Western history. And the more we do this, the more we will say, okay, you know what? Maybe we can come to the table with a different voice. One reality of Western history is that they are constantly between two extremes, constantly. And Roe versus Wade is one of them. One side, no abortion whatsoever, period. A woman is assaulted and that results in an, a pregnancy, you have, that's it, you have to deal with it. And the other side, if the baby is one second away from being born, you can go ahead and kill it. Two extremes, for absolutely no reason, whatever your choice, this child has absolutely no rights over the parent. But the other side, the parent has absolutely no rights over the child, two extremes. But maybe by now you have already read and listened to the lectures about what is Islam's position about abortion. The majority says you have 40 days, 40 days. And then if there's some sort of medical reason or some sort of other problem that justifies extending it to 120, well, there's another opinion that says 120 days. Why? Because 120 days, Allah sends the angel to blow the soul into the fetus. And now it is a living human being. But why 40? Because at 40 days, the, uh, the fetus it has become formed into a human being. And even then, when you look at the Sharia, our unborn child has rights over us, deserves nafaqa, deserves financial support from the father. And if the father or the mother or the father were to pass away, that child has a portion of the inheritance. As Abu Bakr said, when he was dying, he said, one of my wives is pregnant, and I think it's a girl, so make sure you, you count her in, in terms of the inheritance. So the child, as soon as it's conceived, has rights over the parents, but at the same time, the parents has rights over the child. This is way more balanced, way more flexible, but the Western world constantly, ideologically speaking, falls into these two extremes. Another example 
is body image. How do we view the self? You have two extremes. From the extreme of Augustine, who says that the body is cursed. And we humans were on this earth because we are cursed. By the curse because our mother made Adam eat the apple and so she's cursed and Adam's cursed and everyone is cursed and this whole world is cursed. And so we just need to focus on the soul. And you have monasticism that erupts as a result of this. People who completely neglect their bodily needs. You have priests and pastors, whatever the titles are, who refuse to get married because, well, I can't. Or nuns who can't get married. And these monks who are sitting there in caves or secluded from the rest of society, why? Because the body is not befitting of its rights. And so we only focus on the soul and we deprive the body. But you have the other extreme of the liberals. The body, my desires, is my Lord. They went from رَهْبَانِيَّةٍ ibtadauha مَا كَتَبْنَاهَ عَلَيْهِمْ from the Rahbaniyyah, from monasticism, which they innovated, Allah did not prescribe upon them. To, to a people who say, see themselves and their desires as the God. I do what I desire. In other words, I submit to my desires. That is worship. But where is Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمَلْنَاهُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِنْ مَنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given dignity, nobility. He raised the status of humanity. And he gave them conveniences in respect and honor to this creation. And Allah has preferred us, raised our status over most of creation. This is a very different perception of the body, of the self, than what you find in some Christian ideologies. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But don't be exaggerant. Don't be extravagant. Don't eat the haram. There are things that harm you. Be balanced. And you find this when you, re when you look at Islam and compare it to Christian ideologies between conservatism and liberalism. When we appreciate this, when we understand Western history and their constant extremes when it comes to ideologies, we have to come back and say, wait a minute. You know what? Islam has something better to offer to the society. And so if I'm going to converse with my coworkers or my fellow classmates or whoever, my friends, my neighbors about these issues, don't be, am I Democrat or am I Republican? Am I liberal or am I conservative? Rather, research what Islam says and you will find what Islam offers is much healthier and a middle point for a society that's becoming increasingly divided to really consider and to contemplate. If I can have people please move up, fill up the gap, fill the gaps. Jazakumullah khair. The second reality about the Western world is that the West is failing. Underline this. The West is failing when it comes to social and familial issues. Don't take it from me. Look at the statistics. The statistics, the statistics speak for itself. Divorce rates above 50%. Children being raised in a single parent home, 25%, whatever the percentages are. Suicide rates at an all-time high. Depression rates, mental health problems, domestic violence, drug abuse, substance abuse, all of this stuff. Where is it coming from? Well, if you don't have a family, you lose identity. If a person in the, in the Arabic language, kabir, kabiruhu shaitan, whoever has, doesn't have a senior person guiding them, showing them, teaching them, correcting them, then they're, the one doing that for them is the shaitan. This is in the Arabic language, a, 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 a wisdom. And so when the family breaks down, you have all of these problems. Should we really look to the Western lifestyle and the Western structure when it comes to how we as Muslims should behave as fathers or mothers, as husbands or wives, or as a member of a family? Or should we really look to something else? And then you have the other side as well, as a family is the most important thing, and if you disobey your parents, you are a criminal, you are rejected, you this, two extremes, it's always between these extremes. But Allah says, the Qibla reminds us, it is a symbol of our moderation of our potential to be role models for the rest of society. So the Western world is failing when it comes to social and familial issues. 
You know, I understand that there are problems in, our, in the countries of our ethnic origins, but how often do you hear that a family threw their parents, their mother, their father, and a senior citizen home? Is this very common in the Muslim world? No, it's unacceptable. Again, there are the problems, of course. But here, it's easier than drinking water. I'm not gonna do with my mother, just go ahead and throw her. And sometimes the children don't even ask. You know, there's this Egyptian lady who lives in France, an immigrant to France. And she has a YouTube channel, and my wife watches her. And basically, she found this elderly man in his later 90s, living alone. What's going on? Her neighbor, where are your children? My children don't ask about me. So okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take care of you. Why do you think she did that? Out of Western values or out of her Islamic values? Of course, out of her Islamic values. And this man accepted Islam. He accepted Islam. Someone in France, can you imagine that? And this isn't just one incident. You have many incidents. I know people here who found a, an elderly lady living alone. She doesn't have any family members, not because they don't exist, but because they don't ask about her. You can go ahead and come live with us. Why? Because that's what Islam tells us. And so we're at a serious divergence, a fork in the road when it comes to human history, because what happens here in the West affects everywhere. And so where, what are we going to follow? We're going to box ourselves in the ideologies of the Western world, which, which we don't share, by the way. We, our history as Muslims is very different than Western history. Conservatism, liberalism, Republicans, Democrats. This goes back to West, the Western experience as per their history. Our history is very, very different. So what is it going to be? Are we going to embrace what the Qibla really means? what it represents, a ummah that is wasat, a ummah that is moderate, balanced, meant to lead and be a role model? Or are we going to box ourselves into pro-Wade or uh, pro-this or against that or Republicans or Democrats? And the third reality of the Western world is that the West has a history of using violence in ideological disputes. Public dis uh, political disputes, that's a different story. But ideological disputes Look at Western history over the past 500 years. You have the Hundred Year War. You have the religious wars. You have World War I, World War II that wiped out massive amounts of people. You never see this in Muslim history. Yes, there was bloodshed. But over 1400 years, it does not compare even close to what we find in the past 500 years, a third of our history, what we find here in the Western world. And all these wars tend to revolve around ideology, around are we this or that? Look at America. It's on, it feels like it's on the brink of civil war. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not let that happen. And may we be a force to prevent that from ever happening. But you hear a pastor, I heard this today, a pastor saying that we need to take all the homosexuals and shoot them in the, head of the, in the back of their heads. And then you have, on the other side, if you don't embrace fully LGBT, then you are a bigot. We're going to come and indoctrinate your children. Look at the extremes. Do we want to place ourselves in this rhetoric? Or are we going to look to our religion and compare this rhetoric, these two extremes, to how imams have been uh, talking about the issue of LGBT? Look, this is wrong. It's 100% wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it. It's unhealthy for society, it's unhealthy for the individual to practice this. But at the same time, we're going to work with you to help you understand a better way. Understand why this behavior is inappropriate, is incorrect. So which is better? Are we going to identify ourselves as Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal? Or are we going to stand with our pride that the Quran has given us that this ummah is the wasat ummah to be shuhada ala nas, to be leaders and role models for all of humanity? Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah amma ba'd. If I can again please ask you to move forward, fill in any gaps, sit next to each other so that we can accommodate as many people as possible. My dear brothers and sisters, the point of this khutbah isn't to, uh, to, to paint a very negative image of the Western world. As I said, in some areas they are abs we are absolutely lucky. We, it's fascinating the advancements that the Western world has made and we should 
really learn from that. But in another realm, the ideological realm, the family unit, America is simply not, the West is simply not on the best path. And we as Muslims have the Quran to be able to influence these conversations, to do islah bayn al-nas, to reconcile, to unite the people, not to divide them, not to rally the masses. Because some people, as some people have said, this whole Roe versus Wade is nothing more than the Republicans attempt to rally the Christian masses and just to foment the, 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 uh, the already divided country. But you can decide whether or not that's true or not. And so whether you're, you're politically engaged or not, you're in political activism, you know, please remember this, who you're meant to be. And in the season of Hajj, that really comes forefront. And in light of the season of Hajj, I thought I'd take just a few moments to conclude the khutbah, to remind ourselves of the virtues of these days. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that no deeds are better than uh, the deeds that are done in the first 10 days of the hijjah whether that's fasting or doing extra salah, or reciting the Quran. But there is one deed that really comes forefront in the verses about Hajj in Surah Al-Baqarah, and that is Dhikrullah, remembrance of Allah. I believe nine times in about a page and a half, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wadhkurullah, 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 fi ayyamin ma'dudat. Remember Allah. Get those masbahas, those beads, dhikr beads, and go all out. Do your dhikr. It's the best of deeds during this time. Also, Uthiyah um, is something that we, we know is part of this season. If you are financially capable of providing Uthiyah, then you should. I know the Hanafi say that if you're, you're uh, financially capable, it's an obligation, while the majority say it still remains a sunnah mu'akkada, a very encouraged sunnah. But I say here, if you can, you should. It's best when you do it yourself. If you know someone, you can travel a little bit to do the udhiyah yourself, that, is, that maximizes reward. But if you don't have access to that or you would rather send it to a more impoverished part of the world, perfectly fine, nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you Take the meat, then split it into three portions. The sunnah is to split it into three portions. One third for yourself, one third to give as gifts to family members, to friends, and one third as charity. Um, when it comes to not cutting one's hair or nails, I try and emphasize this every time because there is confusion in this regard. Not, taking, not trimming your, your hair or your nails because you have intention to do utiyah is a sunnah. It's not an obligation. And if you don't observe it, it doesn't break your udhiyah. It doesn't nullify your udhiyah. These two are separate things, if that makes sense, right? So if you, you're working and you have to shave, no problem, still give your udhiyah. You plan on not trimming your hair or your nails, but you forget and you trim it, no problem. You just get itchy when your beard starts growing out and you want to trim it, you want to cut it, no problem. It is a sunnah, right? And then... Finally, a father can do uthiyah on behalf of all of his financial dependents. You're a father, you have a few kids, and your wife, you can do one uthiyah to suffice for all of them because the Prophet ﷺ, when he did uthiyah, he said, this is on behalf of myself and my family. And so if you have a son that's older, financially independent, then he should do it himself. If you have a daughter that's married, then her husband should carry that for her. Allahumma ghfil al-Muslimin wal-Muslimat, wal-Mu'mineen wal-Mu'minat, al-Ahya'i minhum wal-Amwat, innaka samee'un qareeb wa mujibu da'awati ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to overlook our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help our brothers and sisters going through difficulties across the globe, whether that's financial difficulties, familial difficulties, health difficulties, or our brothers and sisters dealing with natural disasters like in Afghanistan or political oppression across the globe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make for them a way out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be a source of alleviation for them. Ameen ya rabbal alameen wa aqim as-salah.